Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for your attendance. I want to start off with a question. How much conversion rate will your application lose for a delay of 100 milliseconds? Think about it. Your application has a delay of 100 milliseconds until the loading page comes up. How much conversion rate will you lose? The answer to that is 7%. My name is Adem Mizrahi, and I'm here today to show you how you can improve your application in terms of conversion rate, traffic, and customer satisfaction. A little bit about myself, I work as a stack mobile engineer at Cloudinary for almost two years. I've been developing app for more than 10 years, started back with Objective-C, and moved my way up to Android Java, Swift, Android Kotlin, and recently Dart and Flutter. At my spare time, I also write technical blog because I believe that through putting my thoughts on a page, I'm actually understanding the material better. I've also been teaching mobile systems design at the university for two years. It really helped me improve my Android knowledge. And lastly, and I love to talk about this, I'm a gamer. I love playing games from PC, consoles, you name it. If you ever want to talk about games or want to have a session, feel free to reach me. So before we get started, I want to give you a notion of why would you want to choose to develop a mobile application? I understand that most of you uh, know the mobile world, read and leave code, but why do we go and develop apps? What's so captivating about it? Uh, the following graph shows the percentage of the entire internet traffic in December 2022. We can see that more than 66% is being transferred through mobile devices. Add up to that the 2% from the tablets, and you get more than 68% of traffic that is moving through mobile devices. And there are many reasons to that. Devices are getting stronger in terms of battery life and screen quality, and applications and mobile network are improving as well, which contributes to the overall user experience. One more question. We started with one, but I want to have another one. How many hours were spent on mobile devices around the world last year? I'm not expecting a question, but the number, I'm not expecting an answer, but the number is immense. 4.1 trillion hours. If you take that and you spread it to the average, that means that the average person spends third of his wake time on his mobile device. Third. And let's talk about what moves this world, money. So in the graph, you can see the Apple's App Store revenue from 2017 to 2021. We can see the consistent growth over the years up to the peak of $85.1 billion in 2021. The amount of money that is passed through the store is immense and it comes from your applications, your subscriptions, your consumables and non-consumables. So now that I have your attention, we want to build a successful application, captivating, reaching visual application. We surely need to use assets. Text-only apps won't do. It's not the 90s anymore. We want to show a lot of assets, and we can't hold them on locally on our device, and we can't load them from locally, which would be ideal from performance because usually they change from time to time. Think about Instagram. Think about Facebook. The feed always updates, and not only that. We don't want our users to download huge applications from the store because we're holding so many assets which increase the application size. So instead of storing assets locally, we need to get them remotely. So what is the problem when we're trying to get assets remotely? First of all, we are talking about mobile devices. There is no guarantee that the user has a stable connection. He can be traveling around or just standing at a spot with a bad reception. When getting remote assets can be challenging. If the assets are not optimized and wait a lot, it will be even more challenging to receive them with a bad connection. When we're loading a lot of assets at once, if those assets are not optimized and we get big assets in terms of size, width, height, and file size that are not optimal for the containers they're gonna fill, it's gonna take the device a lot to render them into those containers. This can cause performance issue. 
It takes a lot of resources to decode and render an image into a container. So think of doing that to up to 10 images at the same time. As you can see in the screenshot, what would usually happen is we get to see blanks, holes, or just long loading animations up until the device can actually able to load that image. One of the most common scenarios we run into while roaming is video buffering. I think you can all relate uh, uh, to the following image. Uh, we're on our way somewhere. There's that video that we want to watch. We want to see it. We were desperate to see it. But suddenly, we get the buffering animations. When the video is not fit to the network and the device, this is a very valid use case. And there are ways to improve this. Some applications support orientation changes, switching between portrait and landscape. This affects the asset size. Do we need to get a new asset for each orientation or do we use the same one? Um, which might not look so good. You know, we, we, we might get, you know, disoriented images, which, which happens. And device sizes. There are many, many device sizes. Even with the recently iPhone 15 that came out, there are more screen sizes. It doesn't matter if it's iOS, where the problem is less severe, or Android, where it's way worse. We have many screen sizes. The asset size between small phone and a tablet is very different. Do we need to create and pull an asset for each use case? What about DPR, device pixel ratio, for each phone size? How do we handle all of those? And if the asset is not optimized and the file size is large, like it's, it's a big file, this means we're pulling more bytes from the internet, which means our devices modem will work harder, will work more, which means that we're using more battery and basically we're draining the user's battery. Moreover, if the user is not on Wi-Fi, this might actually charge them extra costs for using an extra bytes. Um, and of course, we want to use some kind of a cache mechanism where we keep the assets we already got locally, and we don't want to keep downloading them over and over again. Uh, um, if the asset weighs a lot in terms of megabyte, that means that the app will get like buffed. It's getting oversized, and it might get deleted by the user since it captures too much disk space on the device. As you can see in the list, you know we get to the point where there's not much storage left. We start looking for those apps that take the most. Rendering big assets requires memory, RAM memory. There is so much memory that the device has. And if we try to render a lot of assets with big size, we might run into memory issues. While some devices have more memory and might handle those use cases, the weaker one might crash due to this issue and it happens. And since we're pulling assets remotely, we are dependent on how far are we from the server. The closer we are to the server, the faster we will get the asset. So we just saw that loading many assets without optimization can cause delays in loading speed. It can cause performance issue and even might turn to crashes. But why all of this is important? Does loading speed of the landing page is really that important? And the answer to that is definitely. 100 milliseconds delay will cause 7% conversion reduction. When I say conversion, I mean that a user turned into a paying user or a subscribed user or put something into his cart if we're talking about M-commerce. Take this number, multiply it by 10, although it's not a liner connection, but multiply it by 10, you get that for one second of delay, you get 70% reduction in conversion. This is according to a study by Akamai. And there are more reasons to that because one second delay can cause a 20% drop in traffic. Another one, a one second delay can lead to 11% decrease in page views. Page views are the amount of pages that users see in your app. The less they see, the less likely that they will turn into paying users. So we need to increase the page views, not decrease them. And another one, one second delay can lead to a 16% decrease in customer satisfaction. And that might lead to bad uh, story views and people deleting your app. And that is not something that we want. All those three slides are according to a Google study. And I'm here to talk to you about improving your media optimization. We're not talking about tens of seconds 
improvement. We're talking small numbers, even milliseconds can be meaningful. So now that we stated the problem and why it's important to optimize your media, I want to show you how you can achieve this. And for that, the first thing that we need to do is improve our page loading speed. We want our page to load fast and opt in an optimized way and being rich in media, of course, because all of the apps today, the successful apps are rich in media. This will improve the user experience of our app. To do that, we can start with the following, reduce the size of the assets by resizing, reduce the width and the height. We don't want 4K assets, for example, when we're presenting image feed or thumbnails, reduce, reduce the image quality, compress it. If we don't want to show a full size image, we can compress the image and decrease the quality, but still get a good looking image. We will also need to, to deliver a specific format HEIC, for example, for iOS. Why? Because it's being rendered on the hardware and therefore rendered much faster than other formats. And that since iOS 11 and iPhone 7, since then, HIC is being rendered on hardware and this improves performance significantly. All the things I just mentioned, dimensions, format, quality, will lead to lighter assets, more optimized assets, that will weigh less and we will get them more optimized on our device. So we downloaded an image. We presented it to the user. He decides to move to another screen. Valid scenario. Oh, send the app to the background and open it again. Do we download the image all over again? Of course not. We will use a cache mechanism. So once we download an asset, it's saved on our device and we can, and we can load it locally the next time we want to use it. Of course, we want the asset to be optimized so it will catch less disk space as it can on the device so we don't bloat our app. This slide is for the video world. And here I want to mention adaptive bitrate. Instead of having one stream with one quality, the video player gets manifest of multiple streams in different qualities and resolution based on the bandwidth and more, it chooses the most fit stream and plays it. Think about YouTube. You see YouTube and suddenly your signal drops. You start seeing the quality of the video drops and up until the point where it's actually getting pixelated. That's adaptive bitrate. Responsive, we want to be able to get the same asset in different sizes. For different orientations, for example, or for different containers, we want to get the same asset in the most optimized way, small in size, better in bandwidth usage, device storage, and device performance. Content Delivery Network, or CDN for short, is an extremely important mechanism. This means that there is a grid of servers all around the world that we cache our delivered assets on them once they get there for the first time. This means that the second users that ask for that same assets, it will be delivered faster since the distance between the user and the CDN server is much shorter than the user and the main endpoint. And some of us might have a website which presents the same assets as our mobile application, but desktop design is very different from mobile application. The size of the assets may vary depending on the platform, and we need the same image, but in different size. Keeping multiple instances with different size for the same assets is a good solution. Even better, if each device will get the right asset for it in terms of size, in terms of format, and everything that we mentioned before. Now that we've seen what a challenge we're facing, what are the implications, and how we can handle it, Let's get practical and see some code and how we can achieve better performance on our app. So what I did is I pre-prepared an app that I've already built on an Xcode and I will run it on a simulator. You can see the app here. There are a few items here and I wanna start with the first one. The first thing that I wanna show you is optimization because that's basically what we talked about. How can we optimize an asset? And I'm gonna show you a little scenario that I built. So if I'm clicking optimization, you can see two images popped up. 
Now, if you were here with me, I would let you guess which is the original and, and which is the modified or the optimized image. But since you can't answer, I will do it for you. So take a second, think if you can actually guess. And if you can't, let's see. So as you can see, the original is on the top and the optimized is on the bottom. The original is 6,000 uh, uh, pixels on 3894, which weighs almost seven megabytes. But then we took our optimized and we reduced the size to 2400 on 1558, which weighs about six of the original image. Now, if we dive deep into the code and actually look on what we did, I want to show you. So we are using here the Cloudinary iOS SDK. The first thing that I do is I'm initializing my Cloudinary object, which I give the cloud name. You can register at the website and get your cloud name. It's super easy, uh, not much into that. Then I'm taking my Cloudinary object, I'm creating a new URL, and I'm setting some transformations. I'm setting the quality to auto, to auto, the fetch format, the format to HIC, the DPR to auto, and I'm reducing the width by 0 0.4, but I'm scaling. So basically I'm keeping the aspect ratio. And as we can see in the example, the same image is being much more optimized and much easier for the device to render and load. Let's see some more examples. So I'm going to show you a few things that this SDK can do as well. Optimization was just one of them. Things that we can do such as transform, for example. So we have the original image and we are transforming it using an effect called Safia. There are hundreds of transformations that you can run on an image and video. Safia is just one of them. There are overlays, text overlays, image overlays. There are things that you can do with effects. There are also the optimizations transformations that we've seen. There are transformations that allow you to capture a specific things like gravity. We can crop the image and ask for gravity auto. So the, the backend will know automatically to center around the most interesting object in the image. Those are just a few examples of hundreds of transformations that Cloudinary can do for you. Let's see a more complex uh, um, uh, 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 transformation. So we have here a cup of coffee and we rounded the corners through uh, the URL. We set an image overlay of that cute couple and we set a text overlay that said love and we added another balloon. If you want to see it in code, that might look a bit scary, but it's really that easy. So we're setting the transformation and then we're adding everything. We're setting a new overlay of the nice couple. We are setting the saturation effect. We are setting a vignette effect and we're adding another layer of the balloon, which we saw on the right side. And then we're adding the text overlay, which says love. And all of that is being done easily through our iOS SDK. Again, the first thing that we see is that we set the width and height with the gravity to sound. So there are many, many, many optimizations and transformations that you can run through this SDK. I'm just showing you a few examples, but feel free to download it and play with it and set it as you like. A few more things that I want to show you. One of the main scenarios that we have in mobile application is what is called UGC, user generated content. For that, we give you an easy solution, how to upload an image to the Cloudinary Cloud, which is super easy. So I'm going to open up the gallery. I'm going to choose that cute rabbit over here. I'm going to get that loading animation while the image is being uploaded into our backend. And voila, we got the rabbit. I want to show you the code, how simple that is to uh, upload an image uh, uh, with the Cloudinary URL. So we have the upload image once we get the image from the gallery. And all we need to do is call our Cloudinary object, create that uploader, call the upload function, send it the data. Here I'm turning the image into PNG data using the Apple's API. An upload preset is something that I'm not going to elaborate about, but it's something that you create on your cloud and it's like a specific ID to, the, to that specific upload. And we have a, compl a completion handler. We're sending the image into our image view. This image view is not a UI image view as you know it. This is a CLD UI image view. I will talk about it in a few minutes. And of course we're hiding the animations and that's it. So one line of code, to upload an image. 
The next example I want to talk about is Upload Live. So we just talked about UGC and how important that scenario is. But what if I want to upload really, really big files? Think about videos in TikTok. They don't wait about 10 or 20 megabytes. Those videos might wait a lot, depends on their length. So for that, we have the Upload Large function. Here, I'm going to choose that video of 28 seconds. <clears throat> and then... It will be compressed, first of all, by the iOS and by our widget, and then it's going to be uploaded. So we're going to see that animation for a few seconds, and soon that video will appear once it finished uploading. Excuse my slow internet. Uh, it's really dependent on my bandwidth. But as you can see, now we got the video, and the video is playing, being played automatically. Why? Because that's the way I said it. Again, we are using an SDK video widget, which I'm going to talk about in a bit. But while it's playing, I want to show you the code and how easy it is to upload large files using our SDK. So again, like we saw with the upload, one line of code, we are creating the Cloudinary object, create an uploader, and we upload large. We give it a URL this time. We're not giving it the actual data, but we can. But here we're giving it the URL we got from the gallery. Again, we're setting the upload preset. We give it a few params, which is just to say that we're uploading a video this time and not an image, okay? And we're setting the chunk size. We're setting, we're actually splitting this file, this large file into number of chunks that are being uploaded in parallel. So we're sending each chunk into five megabytes. And when it's finished, we're creating the video player and playing the video. Moving on, we have a fetch upload, which means that we are using a URL. I'm gonna show you what it looks like. Um, so what we're doing is instead of, you know, uploading the file from a URL down, I mean, downloading the file into our device and then uploading it, we're doing everything simultaneously. We're just supplying a URL for Wikipedia. The reason I put the Safia effect here, so you understand that this bottom image is coming from my cloud. This one is originally from Wikipedia. And here I'm just supplying the URL and it's being automatically uploaded and presented to me. That is called fetch. One more thing is a pre-processing. We have this huge image of a car, which I don't need, but I want to upload it to my cloud. But why would I want to upload 4K? I need it much, much smaller. So I'm clicking the upload. And what will happen is we're processing some things before we upload. And you can see that the result is 500 on 333, but that's the way it was uploaded from my device. Let's look at that for a second. So what I'm doing here with the code is I'm doing a pre-processing through the SDK, I'm performing a few steps, limiting the width and height to 500, turning it up in 108 degrees so you can see the difference between the images, setting the, the format to PNG and the quality to about 70%. And that's the result as you can see. And that's before I uploaded, that's why the upload was so quick because I uploaded a really small image. We also have the upload widget, which is kind of the same like the upload, but it does everything for you. So when I select, once I select the image, it's being uploaded completely free of code for me. So upload widget would look something like this. I'm opening the widget and once an image is selected, I'm getting the upload requests and the response that is being automatically done for me. Again, no must to use it, but it saves a few lines of code. We said before, we talked about the image widget. And the image widget can do a few things. It, it can load the image locally, it can load the image remotely, and it can load an image using a special ID from Cloudlane, which we call a public ID. Let's see that in code. So image widget, and as we can see, we load locally from a UI image from my assets catalog. We load it from a URL, which can easily be done. And we use, we're using a public ID from Cloudlane, which is called SampleD here. But what's cool about this widget is that it has its own cache mechanism, which means that once we uh, 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 use the image, it's being cached on our device smartly, smartly. And next time we want to use it, it will be loaded locally. We won't have to download it again. The last thing that I want to show you is our video player. And I split it into two. We have the layer, which doesn't have any controls. And we have one with a controller, which I can play. The cool thing about the widget is that if you have subtitles attached to the video, it will be played automatically. And not only that, this player by default automatically tries to pull a manifest of streams. 
which calls in, in our terms, it's called uh, automatic streaming profile. And that is by default, unless you disable it. And then we get a smart video. So if the banter drops, the player will drop it as well, the quality and start pulling lower quality streams, which is really nice. And that is for the part of the, uh, of, of the live coding. And I'm gonna go back into the presentation. So we've just seen practical tools of how you can achieve better application performance. Next, I want to show you a real life example. Just Eat is a food delivery company who mainly works at the UK and Australia to an app and website, which you can, folder, you can order food on. To improve their users, user experience, Just Eat optimized their assets, which cut their page loading time in the following screenshot, you can see the app. You can see the image feed where you can scroll between different restaurants and you can see that the screen holds multiple assets and it uses some of the techniques that we've seen in coding before, such as quality auto and format auto, DPR auto, and you can even see here round corners as well. The menu screens offers different size images, more thumbnail style. We can see round corners and even border for each image. By optimizing the menu assets, just it increased the menu usage, page views, and decreased their loading times. On the left, we have a specific dish menu where you can see the same assets from the menu screen. We just saw in the thumbnail, but in bigger size. Without losing any quality, the image looks great. On the right, you can see the same dish presented in just its website. Same assets different sites. What I just showed you is a tool we created at Cloudinet. It can help your application improve delivery by up to 60% and data usage by up to 80%. The library I've just shown you through live coding is written in iOS, but it's written in more than other 15 languages, such as Android, Java, Kotlin, Flutter, React Native, and more. So a little wrap up of what we've been through. We talked about why even a uh, developed mobile application? What is the challenge that we are facing? Why does it matter? And the solution. I gave you practical tools on how you can optimize your media and with that your application's performance. The important thing to remember is media optimization done right can improve your application conversion rate, traffic, and customer satisfaction. I want to thank you for attending and listening, and I hope you learned something and have practical tools to take with you. If there are any questions, I'll be taking them through the chat now. Thank you very much.